Coming up on Need to Know, more kids than you may realize in Monroe County are dealing with trauma. The severe impact of traumatic experiences on youth and how area organizations propose we deal with it. Also on the show, a program connecting kids with their incarcerated relatives through literature is the subject of a local documentary. The story behind Storybook, just ahead. And we'll take you to a place where students aren't only learning math, history, and science, but also how to be caring human beings, where reading and respect are equally as important. That story next on Need to Know. Continuous exposure to an alcoholic parent. Experiencing physical, mental, or sexual abuse by a family member. Being separated from a relative because they're imprisoned. These are all traumatic experiences commonly referred to as adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. In Monroe County, 70% of high school students surveyed say they've experienced at least one traumatic event in their lives. How does this influence a young person's growth and development? According to research, immensely. It can affect grades, cause outbursts in the classroom, lead to suspension, expulsion, and even dropping out of school altogether. Local organizations are coming together next week to discuss what they believe is a promising step to help kids and better equip teachers. How? Through trauma informed schools. Joining me to break this all down is Elizabeth Meeker, Director of Training and Practice Transformation at Coordinated Care Services, Inc. Denise Kwamina, Assistant Principal at Joseph C. Wilson High School in the Rochester City School District, and Megan Bell, Executive Director at the Wilson Foundation. And welcome and thank you to all of you for joining me. So I just wanna jump right in, and Elizabeth, I wanna start with you. Explain the concept of trauma-informed schools. How do they operate? Trauma-informed schools is when schools have a foundational understanding of just the things that you explained, how frequently trauma impacts the lives of the children uh, who attend school and their families, and um, the impact on the brain and learning, and then takes that understanding and infuses it into all aspects of the school. So not only um, kind of how they're taught, but the environment, policies and procedures, that everything is being looked at through the lens of trauma. I know next week, as I mentioned, the intro area organizations are coming together and you'll be talking about best practices when it comes to developing exactly some of the things that you were just mentioning. Uh, but you'll also be airing portions of Paper Tigers and it's a documentary that examines a school in Washington state and it's an example of a trauma informed community for students and teachers. So I just want to take a quick look at a film clip that we have of Paper Tigers. There are the kids that get labeled, get rid of them. Lincoln sits right in the heart of the most assaults, gang activity, truancy. I did hear that it was the worst school you could ever go to. Absolute chaos. He pissed me off and I threw a chair at him. And I told him I was going to kill him. I was invited to go to a conference about complex trauma and what stress does to the brain. I didn't want to be alive. It hit me, and it hit me really hard. You have to unconditionally love them, and you have to believe that their behavior might be out of their control. Half of the student body had over a three-point GPA. watch their confidence come back has been incredible. I'm not by myself anymore, I got a team. So in the most recent Monroe County Youth Risk Behavior Survey, the ACE scores, the Adverse Childhood Experiences, those scores were shared for the first time from my understanding. And I wanna get a sense, what do, first of all, what do ACE scores tell us? And then locally, what do they mean? What can we learn from the most recent scores? And, and Megan, I'll ask you to, to take that. And ACE scores really, 
give an indication of some of the experiences kids have had. And this is for kids in all over our community. And it can range from separation from a parent to some really severe behavior at home. And that tells you, you know, maybe some of the struggles that kid, kids might have and also some of the risky behaviors that it might lead to some of the health problems that it could could lead to. And, you know, Elizabeth could probably maybe talk a little bit more about some of those behaviors. Um, right. So what we've um, been able to see, just like the original ACE study, is in Monroe County when we look at the ACE scores in combination with the uh, youth risk behaviors, the higher someone's ACE score is, the more likely they are to be experiencing mental health challenges, to be involved um, in violent behavior, carry a weapon, um, feel suicidal, or actually act upon those um, feelings. Um, so the, it sh kind of shows that cumulative effect of trauma. So while maybe someone uh, is able to cope with one or two of these, as you experience more and more of these ACEs, it becomes more difficult to kind of uh, cope and so people adapt different high risk behaviors. So when this information is then revealed, what, how do students, or I should say, how do staff and teachers, how do they make this shift, so to speak, to, to better help and equip young people dealing with these things? Um, so I came from East prior to being at Wilson. And so yeah. one of the things we did, um, we started off with a, a global informational session on what happened to you. Um, rather, rather than, you know, why did you do what you did, right? Um, and then from there, um, I put out an invite for teachers to come for, to, to a collegial circle. And so we met monthly, talking, studying the book, Reaching and Teaching Students Who Hurt. And so in that book, it gives you really tangible techniques to follow through in the classroom. You know, many of the teachers that actually were in this group had compassion to begin with. Um, so it was easy for them to come follow through and use those techniques to, you know, work with the kids in the classroom. Can you give an example of, of a technique or, or what it would look like? I know you said what happened, asking that question as opposed right. to pointing the finger to a problem. Well, um, for tone, tone of voice. Um, you, your tone, very calm, should be calming. Yeah. Um, being able to observe your students. So standing at the door is one big thing. You stand in the door, you can get a good scan of the students, what their day will be like. Um, I have had teachers who, have since changed their lens from doing referrals, um, were able to scan students and give me an e drop me an email, drop me a phone call. Hey, Kwamina, you know, I'm noticing this. Could, could you kind of speak with this child, sort of thing. So that's, that's how the teachers and the staff should be getting in love, and that's what it should look like. Are some of these things already taking place, or some of these practices, I should say, already taking place in not just Rochester City Schools, but also suburban schools? And is that, I'm trying to get to really an understanding of why this conversation, this discussion is taking place next week about trauma-informed schools. Is it about getting the information out there so people can be more sensitive to it and incorporate it into daily practice? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think one of the things when we work with schools, are there, there's a lot of things and initiatives underway that would fall under the umbrella of trauma-informed, but this is giving them a new lens to understand that, and I think the data is so telling. I think we've all been concerned for a long time with some of these behaviors that we've seen in students, and this gives us a new understanding, and if we can shift our interpretation to understand that this might be a child who's struggling with some really difficult things, um, we can come at the problem in a new way and I think get better results. There's a quote in the, in the film paper, Tigers, that I think is really resonant. It says, stressed brains can't learn. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of these kids, they, don't, they want to be there, they want to learn, they want to do better, um, but they have so many things going on when they're not at school that school becomes another challenge in their lives. And to have a punitive system, a punitive school, is maybe not the right choice or a benefit for this, for this child. So some of this culture change, and when we say a trauma-informed school, it's not a new program to add on, it's not new testing, it's not new anything, it's a culture change mm -hmm. to be you know, person-centered, to really embrace the child and understand their background rather than to educate them and attack at them.
When I viewed the film, it, it seemed as though the teachers at this school, they developed a new sense of understanding uh, in terms of, of connecting with kids and understanding where they were coming from. And I, I wanted to know, I know we hear the term trauma-informed. How does it differ? Because to a certain extent, it looks like PTSD as well. Some of those very same things that you might address when it comes to PTSD. Is, are these two things very different or are they similar just under a different name? Um, you know, PTSD is a clinical diagnosis, post-traumatic stress disorder. What we know is many of these kids don't meet eligibility for that, that diagnosis, aren't, their behaviors might land them with different diagnoses, and again, that might direct the intervention in a different way. And so this is a broader understanding. So whether or not someone develops PTSD um, doesn't mean that we wouldn't be trauma-informed. We can be trauma-informed to anyone who's had an exposure, even if we don't know it or not. Um, and Megan, you mentioned this is not about adding anything new. I know Monroe County has TIG, the Consortium on Trauma, Illness, and Grief in Schools. So does, does, does the work that, that they provide somewhat align with, with what we're looking at in terms of these best practices? Absolutely, and TIG is, is part of our event next week yeah. with the community to talk about this. Um, they're the resource for schools to come to to understand how to be trauma responsive. Um, they're, they're the go-to provider for resources um, along with Elizabeth at CCSI to understand what you can do you know, tomorrow yeah. to, start, to start making small changes and what you can do in the long term to have your entire school have a different culture. I, yeah, know, I think for me, you know, being in the schools, um, experiencing uh, the different behaviors, um, you know, and then applying what I know um, about trauma-informed care, and I could seeing a clear difference um, with the students, the way they approach the adults, the way they approach me once, once you know, we build that type of relationship. And, you know, the bottom line here is relationship building, right? Um, and if you don't have a relationship with the, with the children, they tend not to be receptive to you. Um, and so with me, when I bring kids into my office who have done whatever, according to the teacher, you know, the, the student will say, you know, I don't like him, I don't like her. You know, so it's all about emotions and whether or not uh, the child feels safe with that individual. And if they do not, then you will see the, the behaviors acting out. And so that same child could come to me and we will have a decent conversation about, you know, what happened, how could we help resolve it, wh what do we need to do? You know, and a lot of times, as educators, now that I know better, um, we will talk to kids about, um, don't you want to go to college? Don't you want to get a good job? Don't you want to have a, a nice house? Well, you know, I finally figured out that, and found out actually, in their world, that is, that is not where they are. You know, so we have to reach the students um, by emotion, letting them know that you care about them. Um, so once they get in a safe setting where they feel safe, where they feel as though they're loved and they're worthy, then we can start talking about future goals. What's the best case scenario out of next week's discussion? Uh, how, do, how, does, how does this work, right? How, I guess I, I want, I'm curious as to what you think um, in terms of really implementing this in schools and, and creating that sense of understanding that this, that this can happen and this can happen effectively. Best case scenario is that some of our districts can go back and say we, we want to embrace this, we will move forward, we will get the education we need to shift our culture and long-term best case scenario, that can impact some of the policy in our community, that can provide some of the resources to help schools become trauma-informed and trauma-responsive and give them the tools they need to be successful. A special thank you to Megan Bell, Denise Kwamana, and Elizabeth Meeker for your time today. I appreciate it. And this is only the beginning of this story. Periodically, we'll share updates on where things stand with trauma-informed schools in our community. And so you can learn more about the documentary Paper Tigers. Just go online to papertigersmovie.com. And as we discussed in our last segment, imprisonment of a parent or relative in one's home is just one example of an adverse childhood experience. But there is a program out of the Ontario County Jail working to build a bridge, to bridge the distance rather, between children and their incarcerated parents through literacy. It's called the Storybook Project, and it's the focus of a local documentary. Take a look. I got charged with criminal mischief in the fourth degree. Criminal possession of a controlled substance, seventh degree. They 
sentenced me a year, so I had to do eight months here. Pretty much the last 12 and a half years. You should let this run for just a few seconds before you start reading. Okay. Okay. Corduroy es un osito que en un tiempo vivió en la juguetería de, de una tienda grande. See the little girl run to her granny, like you run to your granny when you come home? And it looks like they had a, a Mercedes. Woo, they got a nice car, bud. The end. We don't think of people in prison as coming from families worth preserving, worth maintaining, children that we should care about. A real fire truck races past us on its way to an emergency. Wow, look at that fire truck go. You know, you, your body may be locked up in, inside a correctional facility, but they can't lock your mind, heart, and soul up. Joining us to talk about the impact of the program and the mission and purpose behind the documentary Turn the Page is Claire Creamer, the founder of the Storybook Project and director and filmmaker Linda Maroney. And welcome to both of you. Thanks for being here. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for inviting us. Yes. So, Claire, I understand that you were inspired to start the Storybook Project more than 10 years ago by you heard about a program in Texas. I read about a program in a women's prison in Texas. This was in an Episcopal National Newsletter. And in this particular program, both Episcopal and Jewish women were going into a county a penitentiary and taking books for inmates to read and uh, send out. And it just sounded like something that we could do here because of the way our diocese is set up. And so, I had to do a lot of digging around. Priest friend helped me quite a bit to see if, if it would be feasible to do here and uh, to see if the jail wanted us, which it did. Uh, Ontario County is very good about having programs for its inmates, things that will be helpful to them. Nice. And um, so after a lot of months of digging around and setting up a proposal, then I I took it to uh, a district meeting of our our Episcopal Church and uh, got some preliminary funding. Well, you know that one in every 28 children in, in the U.S. has an incarcerated parent, and studies have found that the incarceration of a parent can be more severe than on a young person, more so than death of a parent, even divorce among parents. And that being said, I want to know how does literature, how, what's the case for literature in terms of really serving as this tool to connect parents and young people, um, you know, based on when we hear stats like that? Um, can I take this or did you want you to? You can take it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think going back to what you said about death and divorce, um, kids that experience death of a parent are given, you know, empathy by the community, but kids that have a parent that's incarcerated are stigmatized. Um, often they're not told where their parent is. Often uh, they don't know. And, and even if a parent is away for six months, that's a really long period yeah. in the mm -hmm. life of a child. Um, and you think about bedtime stories um, and what that creates, the energy and the feeling and the nurturing bonds between parent and child in addition to cultivating literacy skills for these kids. Um, for any kids, it's so important. We know reading aloud to young children is so incredibly important. Um, so what they've created at Storybook is, is sort of the best that can happen under these conditions. Um, I can tell you that the children go back to the books and it used to be tapes, now it's CDs, over and over and over and over again. So they are cultivating even more literacy skills from this repetition. So tell me a little bit, Claire, how does it work? How does, how does, how does the process work? Well, the process works. We, of course, have to get volunteers yeah. and they have to be screened by the jail which sometimes takes a while. And uh, we also have to get supplies. Uh, one of our volunteers used to do the children's book fairs at uh, the Canandaigua School. And so she comes up to Rochester when one of these big companies has book sales and she picks out the books and we get them at a, at a very good cost. We also get a good cost uh, discount from the Geneva library um, for things that we need that aren't available any other way. 
And then all we do is set up the times with the jail. We go in twice a month, uh, once for the women, once for the men. We started out with just women. And after a couple of years, the jail requested that we see the men. And I was a little nervous about that. But they actually are easier to deal with than the women. They're not on the surface as uh, emotional as, mm -hmm. as some mm -hmm. of them get. I mean, we have to deal with crying people. and. And we don't want the kids to overhear any of that, of course. Right. Linda, let me ask you, what was it about the story that made you say, I have got to document this for the masses? Yeah. Um, you know, as a filmmaker, I often read the newspaper looking for interesting stories. Yeah. And um, I had read in the Democrat and Chronicle one day about Claire receiving a potted plant uh, for starting Storybook because she was a bold woman of courage. And I thought, potted plant? Sure, but this is an amazing story. <laughs> right. um, and I'm a mom, and I read to my children every night. Um, they're older now. You know, it took a few years to make this movie, um, but, but I knew how important it was. And I knew um, that I could have one drink too many coming home from a party one night and you know kill someone with my car you know not on purpose but but something could happen and I could be there I could be in their place I could make a bad choice um, and so I went in first I had to track down the reporter and then track down Claire and convince Claire and then um, she said well it's okay and um, then I had to speak to the jail and convince them to trust me um, and then I found a really great partner in Ray Maynard of Crystal Picks to come on board um, to work on this film with me um, and, and he was a parent as well. And I think parents just universally get the story. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a lot of discussion about jails and prisons right now, but there's not a much going on in the discussion about the children and how this is affecting them. Claire, how receptive were the inmates and when you first presented this as an option to do? Were, were, were they a little skeptical? Were some excited? <laughs> it's funny that you ask that. The first time that we went in, uh, we were given a group of four women, and one of them was in her 40s, and quite antagonistic, saying, nobody's going to tell me what to do for my child. And um, she wouldn't take a book. But since then, it's been quite different. Of course, word spreads in jail. And uh, they all come in looking for particular books, and uh, they especially like books with stickers. So when for the kids, yeah, 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 yeah. S stickers are a big deal. And I, I don't do any of the book buying, but um, so after the, the, after a parent records the reading, yeah. then that young person, their child, actually gets to hold on to this copy of the book and keep it. Oh yes, because uh, we make a recording, and now we're into doing CDs. We have these little tiny recorders that we use, and. Uh, the CDs get put into the middle of the book for safety and then they're mailed. One of our big problems is trying to find people that can burn CDs. Most of the volunteers, like me, are older. Not as old, but they, it's just a, it's a technology that we just don't have. And uh, we I wanna, just... I want to, sorry to interrupt, but I do want to make sure that we get this in because Linda, before we start the interview, you had the number in terms yeah. of the number of books that have been donated. Yeah, I, I will say first off that what's also amazing is that even if there's five kids, each one gets their own book and each one gets their own package. And there's no sharing. Um, but since the summer of, of uh, 2005, they have sent out 4,989 wow. books to 1,856 kids. Amazing program. Linda Maroney and Claire Creamer, mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to have you both on the show. Oh. And you can see a special work in progress screening of the film, Turn the Page. It's taking place next Thursday, February 11th at the Little Theater. To learn more and to get tickets, go to thelittle.org. Building and sustaining caring communities. That's what steers the work of a nonprofit focused on character development related to bullying and other behaviors impacting a school environment. The program is called We Are 3C, and it can be found in school districts throughout New York, including Fairport and Churchville Chile. The leaders behind the nonprofit say changing school culture and creating classrooms of acceptance can be a reality. Here's more on our American graduate champion, We Are 3C.
welcome to our uh, We Are 3C lesson here, where we are celebrating what? Who can tell me what we're celebrating today? Alyssa. What makes us special in the community? Yep, so what we bring uniquely individual to our community here. When you think of a typical classroom lesson, you might not think about studying respect, kindness, and compassion. But those are the very things being taught here in Lindenville Central Schools. I found this when I was playing in the creek one day. Today's lesson on celebrating one's uniqueness is part of the We Are 3C learning curriculum. A lot of people, especially sometimes in education, don't understand that you just don't teach history and algebra and social studies. There are skills that are associated with a student learning the skills that are associated with pro-social behavior. And it's not just their parents' responsibility. We Are 3C focuses on teaching students how to demonstrate respect, forgiveness, self-confidence, and a host of other pro-social skills. Lynn Lee, what are you going to talk about? Uh, we Are 3C causes a cultural change in the building uh, it, and wherever it's being uh, applied. And, and here's the reason why. Uh, the word respect means to recognize the value of someone. Once that value is learned, the behaviors change and become intrinsically motivated. A couple years ago, I started drawing. District leaders and students say the program opens a door that was previously closed, creating trust and camaraderie among students and their teachers. Initially, someone might look in and say, well, that's kind of a waste of time. You know, what are you doing that for in school and so on? But when you make these connections and then watch what happens in the classroom afterwards, that investment is very much worth it. I think it builds good character in you. And like if you connect that way, then maybe you'll be a role model to someone else and they can act like the way you do and it'll be a chain effect for everyone. You can learn more about We Are 3C's character development program online at weare3c.org. This segment was part of our ongoing Need to Know series called American Graduate Champions. We're highlighting individuals and organizations helping area kids succeed on the journey from preschool to graduation. To learn more, go to wxxi.org grad. And that's it for this edition of Need to Know. I'm Helen B. and Duty Hofer. Thank you for tuning in tonight and throughout the weekend on WXXI TV. And be sure to check out the show or your favorite stories from this week's episode online. Just go to WXXINews.org and click on the Need to Know link at the top of the page. Have a good night.